How you act under anesthesia can reveal so much about your brain and how it works, and not only how well it works, but also how bright the lights are running upstairs. But you've probably never heard this from your doctor, even though if you've ever had surgery in an operating room like here, you have actually had a test that may have revealed, at least to some extent, just how well your brain is working and how much cognitive reserve you have, how that correlates to intelligence possibly, and what your risk of developing dementia in the future might be. So I am very excited to share with you because I have never seen a doctor after surgery explain how a patient's brain responded to anesthesia, how fit their brain is. And I also have a very special announcement that I think you're going to find very interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. But first off, if doctors connected with their patients, especially in vulnerable settings like the operating room here, they could learn a lot about how your brain works. Anesthesia is a really special case because when you go under anesthesia, we're turning off the light bulbs one by one, eventually to the point where you stop remembering things and eventually when you stop remembering to breathe and eventually when your heart stops to beat. Of course, there's many different gradations in between there. We don't want your heart to stop beating, but what if we actually tested how you're acting and speaking and thinking when we gave you little doses of anesthesia, like when patients have sedation, like in an operating room that you see here, when the patient is on the table and how they're responding to our questions. That is, if your doctor ever asked you any questions when you were under anesthesia. Well, if you build a trusting relationship with your patient, you'll see that there's two things going on. One are the anesthesia requirements. The other is the cognitive reserve. So they're not always the same thing. When patients have red hair, if they're taking lots of psychotropic medications, maybe Xanax, Ativan, Prozac, Zoloft, Cymbalta, etc. These will all increase your anesthesia requirements to a certain extent, meaning that you might need more anesthesia out of the ventilator, more of the IV anesthesia, the propofol or ketamine or etomidate, but that doesn't mean that you have a higher intelligence. This is really important because many patients will need a lot more anesthesia because they're trying to fight it subconsciously or not. And when they fight it, they are combative, agitated, delirious, emotional, kicking, screaming. There are some patients that need higher requirements, but they are coherent. You're able to have a conversation. They can ask questions of the doctor and the doctor can ask them back. And it's very telling. It's like their brain is opening up in some ways like a book. Because even though you've turned off so many light bulbs and so many cogs and gears, they're still functioning and they're not disinhibited. Disinhibited is like when someone has too much alcohol or if you have other intoxicants on board, doesn't mean that you necessarily have a strong cognitive reserve. It just means that your brain is disinhibited. So alcoholics, chronic marijuana users, for example, any other number of drugs will increase your requirements, but you will be disinhibited under anesthesia. When you have a high cognitive reserve, it means that you're still functioning with cogs turned off. And that is important more than IQ because that may predict your risk for dementia. And unlike IQ, you can modify your cognitive reserve. How do you increase your cognitive reserve? Well, it's what we're doing right now. You are asking questions about whether they're, whether you are, I'm just laughing at your comments, Cindy Dotson. <laughs> this announcement today is for you. All right, so stop making me laugh. Let me focus on this today. Your cognitive reserve is modifiable based on, yes, certain supplements that you can take, We'll talk about lion's mane, resveratrol, curcumin, et cetera, at the end, but also based on your mental health, your cardiovascular health, your educational level, and what we are doing right now, which is a combination of social connection, of learning and engaging cogs in your brain, will all 
increase your cognitive reserve. Study after study after study. It's not just about the diet, it's about the lifestyle, which is why we now say Mediterranean diet and Mediterranean lifestyle. And my announcement, this has been months coming in response to you asking me for so long, is how can we build a community to engage and inspire a Mediterranean lifestyle, if you will, so that we can increase our cognitive reserve and be inspired to advocate for ourselves in this broken healthcare system that we unfortunately all live in. And that's why I'm excited to announce a Medical Secrets exclusive where you can now have access to private live streams. You can go to medicalsecretsmd.com slash exclusive and you can sign up. Not only will you support me doing this for you, but you will have private access to myself in monthly live streams, twice a month to start, so we can actually get to all of your questions because you have asked and we've run out of time every single time. And I want to share right now about what are ways that we can prevent the age decline in reserve, which by the way, under anesthesia opens up very well, very clearly. When patients come in depressed, isolated, in addition to what I mentioned about strokes, heart disease, unmanaged diabetes in particular, smoking, possibly marijuana use, we're still learning more. That increases, we believe, the risk of developing dementia for which we have no cure. But notice that everything that I shared, by and large, is lifestyle modifiable, especially the social connectiveness. And we don't talk about this because there's no pill to sell patients for social connection because we know that loneliness has a tremendous impact in the operating room and on your brain moving forward. So lion's mane, I mentioned earlier, comes from a fungus. It's not a psychoactive or a psychedelic, I should say, medication. It's not like LSD. It's not like uh, MDMA. It's not like ketamine. But it certainly can promote what we call neurogenesis, or it can promote, if you will, brain health in ways that we don't quite yet understand. But it's not going to be as profound an effect as physical activity, social connection, etc. Curcumin, resveratrol, these all go through the CERT1 pathway, which we do believe is what we call anti senescence. It's promoting longevity in some ways. Now, once again, these are not going to overtake the effects that we said earlier about what takes away your, your cognitive reserve. And, and this is important because when you're in the operating room, I see patients here in the Bay Area every day who are taking supplement after supplement after supplement. We can add methylated B vitamins. We can add quercetin. And these will have an effect in some patients more than others, but it doesn't overtake the effect that the other elemental foundations will play in the patient. Because when the patient is going home after surgery without someone to take care of them, without, without someone to cook for them, make food for them, without someone who's going to help them through an AA program, help them get off of their anti-anxiety medications, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, no amount of quercetin is going to get over that hump. I'm not saying it's not helpful. And in some patients, it might be more helpful than, than others. But we do need to recognize that there is no pill for those fundamental building blocks that build your cognitive reserve. And that is what comes up under anesthesia. So what I want you to do is, if you ever have anesthesia again, whether it's an endoscopy or a colonoscopy or even a more general surgery, ask your anesthesiologist. Say, doctor, could you please tell me how I reacted under anesthesia? Because if it was a case with sedation, you may have been able to have a conversation. You might not remember it, but I'll tell you, one of the most profound patients I had was in his 70s. It was a man who was a physician himself, and we had a full-blown conversation. He was watching the vitals on the monitor behind me. And he was asking me, doctor, what does it mean that my heart rate did that now? What does it mean that my blood pressure did this now? My oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that tell you when someone can have a full-on intellectual conversation with somebody under 
sedation. How many cogs and light bulbs do they still have upstairs that as more light bulbs turn off with age, they still have a reserve? You can affect that reserve. And it helps if you know where it's at. I'm not saying to have anesthesia just for that reason, but certainly do advocate for yourself and ask your doctor to tell you because you will only gain more information that might be enlightening and inspiring for you and your family to help improve your own cognitive reserve. And I want to be very clear one last time, this is not about intelligence. I'm not saying people are dumb or smart under anesthesia, but I'm saying that your ability to have a higher requirement and be coherent, not just someone with red hair, not just someone who smokes a lot of weed, who has a high anesthesia requirement and is combative, but someone who's able to be coherent and maybe to an extent intellectual. It happens. I see this in the operating room every week. People that are at the extremes of age, like 70, 80, once I even had someone in their 90s who had a fitter brain than someone I should say most patients, in their 30s or 40s. And you bet, it was a Mediterranean lifestyle, like we said, like we talk about on this channel every week in our live streams. I hope that you remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And if you appreciate me sharing this with you, please share this with others. If you want to check out the exclusive access there where we can have more private conversations, where you can learn and ask me questions in a smaller form so I can answer your questions, do please check that out. Until next time, you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. I do want to answer some of your questions though, so we'll give, uh, <laughs> hang out here for a couple more minutes. Red hair, says Suburban Housewife, yes, I have a couple videos on the effect of red hair. The Melendocortin 1 gene, we don't understand quite what it's relation is to anesthesia requirements, but something does appear to be there because sevoflurane, the gas out of the ventilator behind me, needs about 10% more dosage in patients with red hair. Very good question. Candice, yeah, that's right. Stephen Rapp, thank you as always for your encouragement. Um, and you're absolutely correct that communication starts with patient questions, knowing the right questions and when to ask them. More examples, yes, we will get to that book. I think it's quite important, Stephen, I really appreciate your support. Hey, Cynthia, thank you for the kind comments, and Allah, same. RJ, RG, just had a colon, a, a bronchoscopy. Took him two days to recover. 66-year-old female, I felt like a train hit me. I'm sorry that she had the headaches. RG, the train may have been from succinylcholine, and we'll talk about that medication in future live streams, the rest of the general fatigue could have been from any number of reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean that you had a low cognitive reserve. Um, how much air does a human body consume? Uh, about 250 cc's a minute. That's oxygen. Uh, and Linda, thank you so much for the super thanks. I'm sorry if I didn't see it. It, it, it just blew by, but I really appreciate your support. Uh, Miss Chris, you're so welcome. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, yes, personal channel for Kelly Monk. We talked about EDS in many other videos. We also talk about POTS, fibromyalgia, and other dysautonomic conditions. They do impact what happens in the operating room, partly because of altered chemistry throughout the body and also altered neurochemistry in the brain. Uh, Melissa Malone, what does it mean when you shake coming out of anesthesia? Typically, it's because we don't know why. That's the textbook answer. In my experience, I find shaking to be either from what we call neurogenic tremors, which may have a basis in PTSD. It could be from, your, from being cold, from being in pain, from having a low oxygen status. It could be for many different reasons. It depends on the patient. Ch Tracy, I'm so happy you learned something new. Carol says, what happens when you cough and your heart spikes while under? Well, in most individuals, nothing happens. We just give more anesthesia to help blunt the cough reflex. Proud American says redheads are hard to knock out. And like we've talked about before, that sometimes is true, not always. Prospective numeric, good to see you again. What is the approximate IQ of someone that is waking up from anesthesia? You know, we don't measure IQs in those cases, but it's probably going to be close to zero because you have pretty much zero cerebral function. All that's functioning are deep reflexes in your spinal cord and brainstem that try to remove a breathing tube. 
Nothing is going on upstairs when you're extubating. Linda Dove, if you get your intubation videotaped, I would love to see it. Um, Palomino, D'Alessandro, talk all that stuff to me in my sleep. I like your voice. I don't understand a word of the medical explanations. Palomino, I'm so sorry if it was not clear. Please let me know what I could explain more clearly. Maybe if you came on at the beginning of the live stream, it would have been more clear. I don't know. But do let me know, please. Is there a difference, asks Merrill's Planet, between left and right-handed people under sedatives? I have not ever observed one. Uh, Cindy Dotson, uh, MS and surgery video. MS also has profound implications under anesthesia because it can exacerbate the condition. Temperature regulation is important and effects with other anesthetics can make the condition worse. So very important to tell your anesthesiologist. Elizabeth, good to see you from the UK, and you top dog, I love that emoji. Uh, Kimberly is allergic to Sugamidex. It is quite rare, but I have heard of it. Kimberly, I'm happy that you have the armbands. Johanna, thank you for the kind comments. Hey, skater, surfer, snowboarder, feeling exhausted, needing a second surgery soon, chronic pain issues. Hopefully second surgery will cure me, but it's exhausting to have to go through. Mentally, I drag my feet a lot. Uh, skater, surfer, skateboarder, it's really important to recognize that because if you enter the operating room already fatigued, maybe you have depleted energy stores. You certainly have depleted mental faculties because when we're having chronic pain, we can't think clearly. I can't think clearly. I had a backache for one day last week and I couldn't get anything done that day. Imagine that for days, weeks, months, years at a time. I mean, how can you? How can you be self-compassionate? How can you heal after surgery if you're living in chronic pain? It's possible, but it's very difficult, which is why it needs to be addressed before surgery. I hope that you have the support that recognizes how important that mind-body connection is. Aunt, good to see you. And hey, Art Kem, you're very, very welcome. Uh, so I hope you guys appreciate This is why I want to have more private live streams because I simply can't get through all of your questions. And you have such good questions that I really want you to be answered so that you feel more comfortable when you speak with your doctor in vulnerable times like in the operating room. Katie Johnson, good to see you. Is it best to let the anesthesiologist know the time you did poorly post-surgery or the times you did well or both? It's important for me to know both, I always ask, before surgery. Um, Cheryl hallucinated for a month after a colostomy. Any idea what happened? Cheryl, I, not being there, I can't know what happened, but it may have had to do with the medications, with, with your mental health, with the degree of the surgery, blood loss, so many variables, I really can't say. Um, Zatasha Fleming, what do I do for a living? I am an anesthesiologist, Zatasha. Uh, all right. Does ADHD affect anesthesia? Yes, it does, Heather. Yes, it does. Um, oh my gosh, so many great comments. Um, why does vomit come out of anesthesia? Or why do you vomit come? Some patients do because of the anesthesia, because of the pain medications, because of the pain of the surgery itself. Carol asks, why do I wake up crying? Carol, I, uh, very good question. I've answered on many live streams before because it happens so often, yet doctors don't explain to patients not only that that's a possibility, but why it might happen, which can be from pain from your emotional state before surgery, PTSD opening itself up, possibly from low oxygen saturation, high carbon dioxide levels, feeling cold, any number of reasons. We call it emergence delirium because some medical professionals don't want to go into the bag that I just briefly opened up with Pandora's box there. You see how if there isn't time to speak with a patient, it's easy just to blow it off and say it was emergence delirium you'll get better soon. The reason why that's not appropriate, Carol, is that emergence delirium might be a predictor of psychological problems in the future. So if a patient has really bad emergence delirium and there is not a good explanation for why, meaning it wasn't like unmanaged pain, wasn't out of whack vitals, 
perhaps the patient would be better off knowing what happens so that they can modify their lifestyle to maybe prevent things from getting worse in the future. What do you think? This is just my opinion. I don't know what you think. I would really be curious. Most anesthesiologists, says Tina, call you the night before so you don't get a chance to talk as much as I think I should. Well, uh, I do like to call my, my patients the night before. I don't know if that happens in other parts of the country. Um, Heather says, I have ADHD and can't be pre-sedated. I climb into the surgery table wide awake. Heather, it depends on different patients. I usually give some pre-sedation if the patient needs it. It's not an all or nothing about ADHD, if, assuming there's nothing else going on medically. Do all patients poop, asks Linda. No, not all of them. Hey, RG, thank you for that. And if you did learn something, do please hit that like button. Your support helps me do this more often. Why did propofol make my oxygen level drop? Because propofol turns off your reflex to breathe. Dar dar, MS patients. Yeah, a lot of things we need to consider. Um, have you had, do you have MS? If you're comfortable sharing. Have you had anesthesia before? Let us know what your experience was. Jessica, good to see you. And skate surfer. How does patient position during surgery affect everything? It affects everything because it affects where blood flows and how you breathe and where you bleed. Uh, okay, let's do three more questions. And Palomina asks ketamine. Yes, ketamine is very powerful, Palomina, when used in the right context. We talk a lot about it on this channel because it's used incorrectly and unresponsibly in many recreational and some medical settings. Even here in the operating room where it might lead to patients having hallucinations that could have not only been prevented, but the ketamine could have been used instead for a healing experience. How unfortunate is that, Palomina? We give a medication that can actually be incredibly healing but because we don't explain it, we don't tell the patient anything about it, it might just give them hallucinations and they wake up thinking, wow, it's an anesthesia is a terrible trip. I never want to have it again. Heather says, at ginger, it can help decrease saliva production, helpful in ENT situations. Are you referring to glycopyrrolate or atropine? Because you are absolutely correct. Um, hey, Katie, thank you for sending those healing thoughts to Maui. And one last question. Oh, maybe two, because Shay Mayberry asks, what kinds of concerns arise in administering anesthesia to patients prescribed benzos? Shay, it depends on why there are prescribed benzos, the type of benzo, and the dose of benzo. There's a risk for increased anesthesia requirements, as well as increased somnolence, depending on when the last dose of the particular benzodiazepine was. Oh. Stephen, thank you again for that super thanks. I, I didn't see it until just now. Can my son get an appointment with you? He has a double testicular cancer, RPL and non-sparing. Um, well, I'm so sorry to hear about your son, Stephen. You're always welcome to reach out to me in any of those channels. If you go to the website uh, through email, uh, I look forward to connecting with you. I certainly appreciate your support. What I've been doing, I would be happy to help speak with you as well. Um, Okay, we'll end with oh, so many good questions. Uh, Melissa, you're so welcome. And we'll go to the last question that was asked. Hey, Kimberly, thank you. Uh, Davis, oh, Ebert, I don't think I've seen you before. I had two endoscopies in the last six months. I was wondering why I remember everything the most recent time from the post-op room onwards, but only remember when I got home from the other one. Davis, great question, because it speaks to the types of medications and tolerance that might be built up. When patients have two similar surgeries in close proximity, it's often seen with cataracts, where one eye is done, and then a couple months later, the other eye is done. Patients remember more from the second experience. It might be because they built up tolerance to the midazolam or the benzodiazepine, that's also called Versed. That's the amnesia drug. When you get one dose of that, well, you might need more the second time around. Or it might be from you having been in, ex in an experience before and just remembering more of what happened because it's not foreign to you. Or maybe it's because the dose was different the second time of the midazolam or Versed that was given or more of other 
hypnotic medications are given. For endoscopies, maybe they gave more propofol, maybe they gave more fentanyl, maybe they gave more midazolam or ketamine. Not having been there, Davis, I don't know, but it often has to do with a combination of medications and tolerance by the patient. Very good question. I hope everyone learned um, something new today. I really appreciate everyone's support. As I said before, medicalsecretsmd.com slash exclusive, where we can have, we will have more of these discussions. In fact, we're going to have our first private live stream tomorrow on Saturday, and you are welcome to join, and you will get a chance to ask questions in a much smaller audience where I'll be able to answer them. Until next time, please remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. Until next time.